Good morning or good afternoon or good evening. Uh, welcome to macro unit number seven, our last unit in macroeconomics. This one's about international economics and we're just going to get a taste of some of the linkages between our economy and other economies. You can take entire courses in this in college, you can get a PhD in this. So we're going to focus on what the AP exam focuses on in terms of international economics and they focus on five discrete topics. Um, and I've divided those into five screencasts, and uh, that's where we're going in this unit. All right, so this one's about what's called absolute and comparative advantage, and it forms the basis for the unit. Um, it's essentially about why it is that countries trade and why almost all economists, no matter where they are on the political spectrum, tend to like free trade. So we're going to see why it is that countries trade and what benefits there are um, in terms of trade for different countries. So here's the big idea. Just like it makes sense for individuals to specialize, it also makes sense for countries to specialize. Um, you know, the idea is that people should do what they're best at. Theoretically, I'm best at being a teacher, although that's subject for debate. And so the idea is I shouldn't try to do everything myself. I shouldn't try to grow my own food and produce my own cars and make my own textbooks and sew my own clothes. I should do one or two things and then trade for everything else I need. Well, the idea is that countries should essentially do the same thing. Focus on what they're best at and then trade for everything else. And as a result of that, everyone could have more of pretty much everything. That's what absolute and comparative advantage is about. All right, so let's see why that is. And we're going to go through a typical comparative advantage problem. You're sure to see these problems on actually both the micro and the macro exams. Um, so it's a pretty important topic. So to keep things simple, let's assume that there's only two countries in the world, the United States and Israel. And to keep things super simple, let's say that they only produce two goods, apples and oranges. Again, we're just trying to keep things simple. So we're simplifying the world as much as possible. What you're going to see in comparative advantage problems is typically a table of information that will look something like this. In this table, what it's showing you is how much stuff, how many oranges and apples these two countries can produce, um, in this case, in one year. Now, these are either or numbers. What that means is that the United States, if it focuses only on oranges all year long, can produce 75 oranges. Alternatively, if we take all of our land, all of our workers, all of our time and focus exclusively, exclusively on apples, we would make 150 apples. So we got the same information uh, for both the United States and Israel. And it's important that you recognize that these are either or numbers. Now we could take those same numbers and represent them in production possibility curves, um, a graph that we've seen many times. Here you see the production possibility curves for both the United States and Israel. On the left hand side, the production possibility curve shows us what the United States can produce. 150 apples or 75 oranges or some combination in between. We got the same information for Israel. Now again, we're keeping things simple, so we're going to assume constant opportunity costs, which is why you're seeing straight line production possibility curves. Remember that usually opportunity costs are increasing, which gives us that bowed out shape normally. Here, we're just, again, keeping things simple. All right, first let's deal with absolute advantage. A country is said to have an absolute advantage if it's just better at producing something than some other country. If you look at the table, you can see that Israel in this example has an absolute advantage in producing both goods. It's better at producing oranges, 100 versus 75. It's also better at producing apples, 400 versus 150. Notice that it's possible for a country to be better at everything, to have an absolute advantage at everything. And in this example, it looks like Israel is better at producing everything. Still, it's going to be the case that it's going to make sense for Israel to focus on one of these particular goods, and that's where comparative advantage comes in. A country is said to have a comparative advantage if it can produce something at a lower opportunity cost than another country, and that's the key term, lower opportunity cost. So what we're going to do is try to set up another table and in that table, we're going to try to represent what the opportunity costs are for each of these countries to produce each of these two goods, oranges and apples. 
Now, how we do that depends on what kind of problem we're talking about. And there are two kinds of comparative advantage problems. The problems are called output problems or input problems. An output problem is a problem where the numbers in the table indicate how much stuff, a good or service, can be produced with a certain amount of resources. With output problems, bigger numbers in the table mean that the country's better at producing something. The, the example we have is an output problem, because the table is showing us how many oranges or apples, how much stuff can be produced with a certain amount of resources, in this case a certain amount of time. So we'll do an output problem first, and then towards the end of the screencast, I'll show you what an input problem looks like. An input problem is a problem where the numbers in the table indicate how much of a resource, like workers, uh, acres of land, years, time, whatever, it takes to produce a certain amount of goods. Again, for example, how many days, how many acres of land, how many workers. If the numbers in the table indicated that, it would be an input problem, how much of an input these countries need to produce something. And you can always tell when it's an input problem by thinking about the numbers in the table. If bigger numbers in the table mean that you're worse at producing something, in other words, it takes you more workers or more land or more time to produce the same amount of goods, you're looking at an input problem. All right, so we have an output problem. And the way to deal with output problems is to follow this little rule. With output problems, when finding the opportunity cost of a certain good, let's say good A, we're going to set up the fraction in our new table that's showing opportunity costs with good B as the numerator and good A as the denominator. In other words, if you look at the table, the United States can produce either 75 oranges or 150 apples. So in the table on the right, we're going to try to figure out the opportunity cost of producing one orange. Every time it produces one orange, how many apples is it giving up? Every time it produces an apple, how many oranges is the United States giving up? So here's what it's going to look like for the United States. Again, with output problems, we're going to take good B, make that the, the deno um, numerator, and make good A the denominator. So in terms of the opportunity cost of producing one orange for the United States, we're going to take good B, which would be apples, and the number there is 150, and we're going to divide that by the number that we have for oranges, 75. When figuring out the opportunity cost of producing apples, we're going to do the same thing, but now apples are good A. So the opportunity cost of producing one apple would be 75 over, over 100. Here's what it would look like for Israel. Again, using the same little rule, putting good B as the numerator and good A as the denominator, <clears throat> we can figure out the opportunity cost of producing each good. Now, I don't really like fractions, so we're going to take those fractions and turn them into decimals. Um, <clears throat> I just find it easier to think about uh, decimals. And when we do that, we get a table that looks like this. Every time the United States makes an orange, it's giving up two apples. Every time it makes an apple, it's giving up half of an orange. Notice that those are reciprocals of one another, and they always will be reciprocals. We have the same information for Israel. Every time it makes an orange, it's giving up four apples. Every time it makes an apple, it's giving up one-fourth of an orange. Now remember, the country that has the uh, comparative advantage is the country that has the lower opportunity cost. And that's what we're using the numbers in the table on the right for, to see which country has a lower opportunity cost when it produces each of these goods. If you look at oranges, you'll notice that every time the U.S. makes an orange, it's giving up two apples. Every time Israel's making an orange, it's giving up four apples. Since the United States gives up less to produce an orange, it has the lower opportunity cost, and we'll say that the United States has a comparative advantage in producing oranges. If you look at it in terms of apples, notice that Israel has a lower opportunity cost in producing apples. It only gives up a quarter of an orange when it does so. Every time the U.S. makes an apple, it's giving up half of an orange, which is more. Israel has the comparative advantage in making apples. Now notice that even though Israel had an absolute advantage in both goods, it, only has, it has a comparative advantage in only one good. 
And in fact, it's mathematically impossible for a country to have a, a comparative advantage in both goods. I'll leave it to you to think about that for a second. All right, so now the big idea. We've identified who should produce what. Whoever has a comparative advantage should specialize in that product. But the big idea is that what economists say, <clears throat> excuse me, is that countries should specialize in the good for which they have a comparative advantage and then trade for the other goods that they want. By doing that, what we're going to see is that every country can have more of everything, which is a win-win um, for pretty much everyone in the world. So again, going back to our tables, let's try to see why that is. Remember, the U.S. is going to specialize now in oranges. It's only going to make oranges. And what the table shows us is that if it does that, it'll be able to make 75 of them. If Israel specializes in apples, it'll be able to make 400 of them over the course of a year. Now, let's say the two countries get together and make a deal. They say to each other, you do what you're best at, and then let's trade between each other for the other thing that we want. Let's say that the countries make this particular deal. You make apples, I'll make oranges, and then we'll trade at a ratio of one orange to three apples. Now I know this, this fraction is a fraction that these two countries can achieve on their own. All right, we call those the terms of trade, which means essentially the deal that countries make between themselves. If the U.S. specializes in oranges and then makes 75 of them, think about what would happen if the U.S. were to then trade away all of the oranges it produces at those terms of trade. Remember, it can trade one orange for three apples anytime it wants to now. So it has the ability to make 75 oranges. If it traded them all away at that ratio of one to three, it would be able to make 225 apples. Now notice that if the United States was just alone in the world and making apples just on its own, it would have only been able to make 150 of them. By specializing and then potentially trading, the United States can have more than it could have had just on its own. Same thing for Israel. Israel is going to specialize and make 400 apples. If it were to do that and then trade away all of those apples, again, at those same terms of trade, one to three, it would be able to have 133 and a third oranges. And again, if you notice in the table, that's more oranges than the Israel could have had just by itself if, if it were alone in the world. It could only make 100 oranges over the course of a year. What we've seen is that specialization based on comparative advantage has the potential to make both countries better off. And we can actually see that same exact thing going back to those production possibility curves. Remember, here's what they look like before trade. Now, with specialization based on comparative advantage in trade, the production possibility curves would look a little bit different. They'd look like this. For the United States, the amount of oranges it can have is still the same because it's the one specializing in them and it can only produce 75 of them. But on the y-axis, the amount of apples it could have has been increased through specialization and trade. That production possibility curve is essentially shifted out to the right a little bit. Same thing for Israel. Its apple possibilities haven't changed because it's the one specializing in apples and it's, it can again produce 400 of them. But again, if it were to produce 400 and trade them all away, we saw that it could actually have 133 and a third oranges now, which is more than it could have before. That pushing out of the production possibility curve should look familiar to you. It's something that we've seen before, and in fact, we've called it economic growth. This to me is pretty amazing. Simply by specializing based on comparative advantage and trading, we can push out our production possibility curves. And not only can we push it out, other countries that we trade with can push it out as well. In other words, with the same resources in the world, by simply dividing up who's producing what, everyone could have more of everything, which I think is pretty amazing. All right, so we've seen what an output problem looks like. Let's look at an input problem. Let's say you're given a table with the following information, which is how many workers it takes for each of these two countries, Britain and Germany, to produce one bike or one car. 
Now that's an input problem because the numbers in the table are showing me how much of a resource is needed to produce things. Again, bigger number here, bigger numbers here mean that you're worse at producing. It takes Britain two workers to make a bike. It takes Germany only one worker to make a bike. So in this problem, Germany actually has an absolute advantage in both goods. It's better at making bikes and it's better at making cars. Again, we're going to set up another table to the right here to try to capture the opportunity costs of producing each of these goods, bikes and cars. Now the difference here is how we go about doing that. With input problems, when finding the opportunity cost of a certain good, call it good A, we're going to set up the fraction with good A as the numerator and good B as the denominator, which is the opposite of what we did in output problems. So here's what it would look like for Britain. If bikes are good A, we're going to take the number for bikes, which is 2, and we're going to divide that by the number for good B, the other good, which are cars, which would be 8. So it would look like this for Britain. The opportunity cost of making a bike will be 2 over 8. Opportunity cost of making a car will be 8 over 2. Here's what it would look like for Germany. 1 over 3. And then for cars, 3 over 1. Again, let's turn those fractions into numbers I can actually deal with. Let's turn them into decimals to see what the opportunity costs are. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so now we have numbers in the table that I can mentally work with. Remember, the country with the lower opportunity cost is the country that has the comparative advantage. So looking at it in terms of bikes, you'll notice that Britain takes 0.25 workers um, I'm sorry, it gives up 0.25 cars every time it makes a bike. Germany gives up 0.33 cars every time it makes a bike. Since Britain gives up less to produce a bike, Britain has a comparative advantage in bikes. In terms of cars, Germany gives up three bikes to make a car. Britain gives up four bikes to make a car. Since Germany's giving up less, it has a comparative advantage. It should be producing cars. Now I'm going to leave you with this little table that kind of summarizes how to do comparative advantage problems and online you'll find both a practice assignment that will give you a little bit of practice in working out these problems and also um, a graded or adaptive assignment dealing with the same things. You're going to want to focus heavily on comparative advantage again because they're, uh, they appear on both the micro and the macro AP exams. If you had trouble following the screencast, go through it a little bit slower and feel free to use the pause button. And if you still have problems, come and see me. You've seen basically what you're going to see in terms of comparative advantage problems. Really important to be able to figure out who it is that has a comparative advantage in any given situation. All right, that's it for this screencast. See you next time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the unthinkable has happened. Some sick, twisted individual has stolen every teacher's edition in this school. What do we do? The Clara Snow Day! Does anyone know the multiplication table? Uh, please, please, don't panic. They can smell fear. <laughs>